Hello, I'm Andrew Walker. Welcome to Business Daily. Coming up, a health check on the country's hardest hit by the Eurozone crisis. The turmoil in the financial markets may have passed, but things don't look too good in, for example, Italy. You quickly get a sense of how much is wrong, how tough the business climate is. I was told that costs and taxes were higher than ever. Profit margins were being squeezed. But there are some signs of improvement in some countries, including Ireland. If ever there was a positive statement about an economy, it's the popularity of brunch. There have been times where many Irish people struggled to get breakfast, but now at least we can have brunch. That's all in Business Daily from the BBC. In Europe, or at least large parts of it, it's the summer holiday season. So, time for a welcome break from the Eurozone's overcast economic outlook, perhaps. Especially in countries at the heart of the crisis, most of which are popular holiday destinations in southern Europe. Well, I'm afraid not. The latest figures make for depressing reading. The Eurozone as a whole recorded no growth in the last quarter. The recovery hasn't lasted much longer than a summer holiday suntan. We'll hear short reports, postcards if you like, from most of the countries that have been at the centre of the Eurozone storms in a minute. A group sometimes known, for better or for worse, it has to be said, as the pigs. Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece and Spain. A term that was coined before the turmoil engulfed Cyprus. But a brief word first with my guest throughout the programme, Paola Subaki. She's Research Director for International Economics at the London think tank Chatham House. Paula, it was never much of a recovery, was it, in the Eurozone, but has it now run out of steam? Well, it definitely has run out of steam, and uh, it is worrying. It's, it's, uh, it is very weak, and I think, again, uh, we'll probably close this year with, uh, a, a, with some growth, but very modest, and which won't help countries much in need. And... Um, I suppose particularly concerning, in the, some people would argue, at least in that those latest batch of figures that we saw, was the fact that uh, Germany, the German economy, actually contracted. This is the traditional powerhouse of the eurozone. So, do you think we're, people are right to be worried about that? Yes, it is. I, w- I won't be that worried about Germany because it's possibly uh, something. Um, well, we know is a temporary um, um, factor uh, problem, but um, I'm very worried about Southern Europe. Um, this country, what the countries you call pigs, and I must say, I really do not like uh, uh, this. Well, acronym. I did say for better or, well, better or worse. <laughs> but they, they seem they suffer from structural problems. And they haven't solved them. And we'll come to those, I think, very shortly, because the first of the um, postcards that we're going to hear from is in Italy. Now, there was no international bailout there, but the government does have an enormous debt burden. And the economy is now no bigger than it was at the turn of the century. Alan Johnson is the BBC's Rome correspondent. I'm in one of the cobbled alleyways in the heart of ancient Rome. And when you chat to shopkeepers here, you quickly get a sense of how much is wrong, how tough the business climate is. In a hardware store just over there, I was told that costs and taxes were higher than ever. Profit margins were being squeezed. Across the alleyway, the owner of that picture-framing operation said too many small businesses like his were going to the wall. Meanwhile, a bicycle shop man called Daniello described this as a time of stagnation. He said there simply wasn't enough money flowing through the nation's economy. But I also met Antonella, a young woman who's just opened a clothes shop. She said it took a lot of courage to do that, given how bleak things are at the moment. And she complained about the amount of bureaucracy she'd had to cope with. She was sure that she could have got her business up and running more quickly in other parts of Europe... And she's probably right. That was Alan Johnston in Rome and Paola Subaki from Chatham House. Those concerns about the business climate in Italy, concerns I suspect we'd probably hear in some other countries, notably France. Are those kind of concerns the reason for Italy's economic stagnation? Uh, yes, there are some of the concerns. Italy is an interesting example because the problems predated the uh, global financial crisis. And in fact, actually, Italy was not one of the countries mostly affected and obviously was hit uh, by the subsequent debt crisis in the Eurozone. But when the crisis started in 2008, Italy, for, for a while, thought to be immune. Um, but the problem is with Italy. Italy is a country we hasn't adjusted 
to what we call globalization, to the fact that there is much more competition, that the, 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 the world economy, the a global economic order is completely different from what it was uh, 30, uh, 40 years ago. And Italy hasn't adjusted. And uh, it, it really is... And all the problems were, were highlighted in, uh, in, uh, uh, from, in the report are all there. And uh, what Italy needs is a plan to um, adjust, to, to uh, address some of these, these issues. And again... Productivity growth is essential, changing the type of industry and companies and so on. OK, thanks, Paola. Um, now we turn to two of the countries that did receive bailouts. First, Greece, the one where the Eurozone crisis really started. Ioios Christidis in Thessalonica, the country's second city. Last week, August the 15th, was a major religious holiday in Greece with millions flocking to churches across the country to celebrate the Assumption of Mary. Many were praying for a job. Maria Parascu was one of them. The 38-year-old mother of two lost her job in 2011. Three years later, she is still counted among Greece's unemployed, who represent almost one-third of the nation's workforce. Improving economic indicators mean very little to her. She says people cannot live on indicators alone. But even Greeks who are lucky enough to still have a job do not sound much happier. As for younger people, they seem resigned to the idea of a bleak future. An 18-year-old preparing for his freshman year in college told me he expects no miracles by the time he graduates and that he will probably have to leave the country to find work. Sunny days are currently keeping resentments in check. But as the summer approaches its end, Greeks are bracing for yet another winter of discontent. Yoyos Christidis in Thessalonica. And next to Portugal, another country that took a bailout. Alison Roberts is in Lisbon. August is very much a holiday month here for locals and for millions of foreign visitors. The bustling cafes and shops in downtown Lisbon exemplify the fact that tourism is among a few sectors doing very well indeed, thanks in part to Brits, the single largest group of foreign tourists. Other exports are not holding up so well, while government austerity is among factors depressing investment. It's clear that an initially brisk recovery starting early last year has lost steam. Unemployment has been falling slowly, but the hundreds of thousands of youngsters who've left the country in search of work are unlikely to be able to return any time soon. And without stronger growth, it's not possible to reduce Portugal's mountain of debt, which the right-of-centre government says it won't try to renegotiate. So the Portuguese appear to be facing the prospect of austerity stretching into the far future. Alison Roberts in Portugal. So, returning to my guest, Paula Subaki of Chatham House. Uh, Paula, that was mostly pretty grim stuff, a little bright spot perhaps in relation to tourism in some cases. Yoyos Christidis mentioned someone who said you can't live by indicators alone, which is true, of course. But they do tell us something useful, don't they? And, and are things getting any better, according to the indicators, in Greece to start with? Well, Greece is actually in a very, very critical situation. The economy hasn't hasn't grown since 2007, and that was the last time where they got this massive growth, which was uh, driven a lot by public spending. And gro- uh, Greece has also the largest public debt as a proportion of GDP in, in Europe and one of the largest in the world. Um, and both Greece and Portugal... Uh, are also example of countries which somehow didn't adjust uh, to the new conditions in the world economy. Those were the emerging This is market. the wider globalisation trend exactly. that we're talking about in relation to Italy already. Exactly. And these were actually the emerging markets of Europe before they move into the European Monetary Union and they were upgraded to uh, you know, advanced economies without having quite be there. And so the, the process of just was difficult and they really, during the, you know, in the early days of the monetary union, they benefited from low interest rates. So again, a lot of liquidity, cheap money, that really trigger quite a, a lot of investment. And, uh, and some of these investments didn't really go uh, into any productive activities. They suffered after when, when the collapse of uh, Lehman Brothers triggered sure. the crisis, obviously they were trapped in. And, I mean, in relation to these two countries, do you see, I mean, are we getting near the bottom of the decline, that this very deep decline that they've gone into, especially in the case of Greece? Um, it looks like we are, you know, the indicator shows then, then Greece is actually uh, 
moving out of this, but, you know, we're talking about, uh, just an example, in 2012, the Greek economy dropped by 7%. Last year, it dropped by almost 4%. Is that an improvement? <laughs> okay. uh, well, <laughs> I suppose that's what has to happen before growth resumes and you start to slowly claw your way back up. Exactly. OK, thanks very much for that, Paula. Um, you're listening to BBC for Business Daily from the BBC with Andrew Walker. Now, to continue our tour of the Eurozone crisis, we'll go to two countries, Ireland and Spain, that have quite a bit in common. Both went into the crisis with government finances in apparently good health, but both were hit by a crash in the property market, which also crippled the banks, which had lent money to builders and home buyers. The subsequent deep recession also wrecked the government finances. Both countries received bailouts, specifically for the banks in the case of Spain. Both have seen some recent progress, with unemployment declining and growth beginning to come back. Tom Burridge in Barcelona. In August, the streets here in Barcelona are heaving with tourists. Russians, Brits, Americans, Chinese, all spending big, pumping money into the Spanish economy. Don't be fooled by so much talk of Spain's long economic crisis into thinking that there aren't plenty of flash cars, posh shops and money swirling around and on display in any big Spanish city. But jump in a taxi... And ask the driver if for most Spaniards the crisis is a distant memory and you'll get an emphatic answer. ¿Tú piensas que la crisis económica ya se ha acabado? No, creo que no. Why? Because austerity has made life more expensive here. Wages remain relatively low and so too is consumer confidence. Yes, unemployment has fallen very slightly, perhaps because the government's reforms have made the labour market more flexible. But everyone still knows someone out of work. Pepe, our taxi driver here, who's originally from Cordoba, where unemployment is sky high, says he has friends, family and neighbours who are out of work. Yes, the economic data shows Spain is on a more healthy path than it was two years ago. There are a rising number of business success stories. But when you drive out to the suburbs and talk to people in a city like Barcelona, few will tell you that the economic crisis is over. The BBC's Tom Burridge in Barcelona. And to our last stop, Dublin. Colm O'Regan is a former management consultant, now a stand-up comedian. Let's see if there's anything in Ireland's economic situation that brings a smile to his lips. I'm standing here in one of Dublin's most familiar streetscapes, the sweep of College Green around past Trinity College. In the true style of a country that's economically on the move, it's all being dug up for an extension to Dublin's tram system one of the few public works projects that are tentatively underway in the last 18 months or so. They found some old, possibly Viking-era skeletons during the dig a few months ago. There's an analogy there about skeletons and our former northern overlords there, but I don't have time to explore it in a postcard, so you'll just have to take my word for it. Construction was a dirty word for a while, so much so that now there is a housing shortage, yes, a housing shortage, in the country that gave the world the phrase ghost estate to describe the groups of hundreds of thousands of empty housing units. Turns out the houses were all built where no one wanted to live. So whatever the headlines, some people are having difficulty finding somewhere to set up home. As I look, I see that Dublin is clearly thronged with tourists this year. Tourism is great. It's like foreign direct investment, but tax actually gets paid on the earnings. We can moan about the tourists clogging up the streets, but secretly we're chuffed that they came back. And finally, after a couple of years of being statistically in recovery, maybe the Irish consumer is starting to feel a little bit more optimistic. I was in a restaurant on Sunday and the waitress said she was rushed off her feet all day as she had, quote, 250 hipsters in for brunch. Brunch. If ever there was a positive statement about an economy, it's the popularity of brunch. There have been times where many Irish people struggled to get breakfast, but now at least we can have brunch. So maybe the bad times are over, but after the last few years, I'll tell you what there is little patience for in Ireland. Official economic statistics. The opinions of rating agencies are the cost of our government bonds. Bitter experience has told us that when a small country gets a pat on the head from abroad, it means that someone abroad is making money off us. So for now, we're just cautiously optimistic. And possibly we might have some brunch. 
That was Colm O'Regan in Dublin. And so, to return for the final time in the programme to my guest Paola Subaki of Chatham House. Um, the indicators, at least, have shown some signs of improvement in both Spain and Ireland. Do you think that's a real improvement? There is actually a bit more improvement, but again, um, I think I will make a difference between the two countries, mm-hmm. and I tend to agree that possibly Ireland got... Uh, um, has a better outlook. Uh, the difference is in unemployment. Uh, uh, Spain, uh, the official unemployment, uh, uh, says that a quarter of uh, Spaniards are out of job. And it has started to edge down. That thing, it has started it? to edge down, but it's still very, very high. Mm-hmm. And again, the recovery in the labour market will be very, very slow. And uh, the official figures for the, the overall unemployment rate covers the fact that a lot of young people are out of job. And again, the report says very clearly that and people move out of these uh, countries, they move out of Greece, they move out of Portugal, move out of Italy, go abroad and try to get young people and try to get a better job. The situation in Ireland is different. And again, the unemployment is, uh, rate is, 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 is much lower. So again, it's... Uh, and both countries had the same kind of development of the crisis because they were both... The crisis was triggered by the uh, property market, mm. so over booming And there is a market. perception, at least, in some among some people, that those two countries have made a bit more of an effort, a bit more of a convincing effort in grasping the nettle of economic reform than than some others. Do you, do you, do you buy that? Um, not entirely, not entirely. And okay. again, uh, the economic reforms are a big box and uh, and I think we need to really be careful what we talk about. Mm. Uh, I think uh, there were some, uh, again, some of this recovery was dr- driven by exports and uh, and that really uh, was particularly beneficial for, for Spain. There have been some reforms, but probably uh, in all these countries, all southern European countries, probably reforms need to be much more thorough to really help this country to adjust again to what I said is the, the new conditions in the global economy. Paolo Subaki from Chatham House, thank you very much for being with us for the programme to guide us through the maze of the crisis countries in Europe. If you've got any comments on what you've heard today or indeed in any other Business Daily programmes, do send us an email. The address is world.business at bbc.co.uk. I'm Andrew Walker and that was Business Daily. <laughs>